Okay, all right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan. Um, I'm a writer and curator based in Norwich. Um, I'm also the programmer of Of and By, um, which is an ongoing series of talks, events, conversations that's hosted by the Assembly House Trust, um, where we are. Um, of and By is part of a wider program of contemporary art and activity that's overseen by the Trust's visual arts coordinator, Henry, at the back there, who most of you know, probably. Um, the programme often by doesn't have a thematic design, um, it doesn't develop a set of themes necessarily, but what coheres the programme, however loosely, is that the, the work that's presented um, has some association with East Anglia. Um, at the last of and by, which was some time ago now, maybe in November, um, we were joined by Rachel Cusk, uh, who read from and discussed her novel um, Second Place, which was, some of you may know, was um, based on this account from 1932 um, by Mabel Dodge Luhan um, about D.H. Lawrence's behaviour um, on an artist colony in um, Taos in New Mexico. Um, before that, we were joined by the poet and translator A.K. Blakemore, um, author of The Man in Tree Witches. Um, previous guests have included Robert Gluck, uh, Matt Annis, uh, the Cine Women Collective, um, who organised the Women's um, Film Weekend in Norwich, from 79 to 89. Um, the programme has been running for about four years, and um, you can view some of the previous events, and you can listen back to this evening's event um, online. Next week, I should just say that there's another event which is associated with Rotten Buy, which would be at the Book Hive. The Book Hive are here this evening, um, hustling books. Hello, Book Hive. You're very welcome <laughs> to be here. <laughs> um, uh, but the event next week um, will be Rebecca May Johnson, who will be talking about our new book, Small Fires. Um, but tonight, it's our, our great privilege um, to be joined by the, the brilliant writer, editor, and, um, well, just general wit um, that is Philippa Snow. Um, Snow <laughs> Snow Snow's debut book, um, which, as you know, means violence on self-injury as art and entertainment, um, is published by Repeater this very month. Yeah, it came out last week. Came out last week. Um, and um, Although it was, I should say, delayed on its journey into the shops because of the Queen dying. So, <laughs> um, so it, was, uh, it was also, it was launched, right, last yeah, weekend at Claire, um, at Claire de Rouen in London. Um, and that was a joint launch with the writer um, Stephanie Lacava. Um, which, as you know, means violence, um, is a series of um, four long-form discursive essays um, that are organised around particular figures from body-based performance art and then kind of self-injurious popular and viral culture on television and YouTube. And at the centre of the book are a kind of number of figures, but one of the kind of biggest figures at the centre of the book is um, Jackass, which um, many of you will know um, is a television program that was popularised by MTV in the early millennium um, with Johnny Knoxville um, as this kind of handsome Tennessean ringmaster um, presiding over all kinds of reckless fuckery with his male friends all in the name of fun and entertainment. Um, so as Philippa recounts in the book, Knoxville barbecues himself, Knoxville um, faces a raging bull blindfolded but has done this a number of times in fact. Um, um, Knoxville shoots himself out of cannons, um, he eats a vomit omelette, maybe is in, involved in preparing a vomit omelette uh, and then eating it, all with his crew of sort of outsider-ish um, skate freaks. And as Philippa says in this book, which is available to purchase, um, that Knoxville becomes a kind of Hollywood um, actor who performs his own stunts on set. And then later on, as, as Philippa says in the book, decides that um, a time has come to see a therapist to think about his relationship to pain, to, to, to begin to critically analyse um, and talk through his relationship to pain. But Knoxville is very interesting because Knoxville came up through the pages of the underground skate magazines, but as Philippa says, has been lauded as a kind of embodiment of a uniquely American form of violence. And, and you say violence is, is American uh, as, as apple pie itself. Um, so there's an account of kind of durational, violent debasement, which animates certain forms of extreme masculine performance art of the 60s and 70s in the book. Um, and back then it was NAM and television, and in the millennium it's kind of 9-11 and the internet. Um, 
but Knoxville, while being lauded as an artist, maintains a kind of wariness of this label of being an artist. And I think what's so great about this book is that Philippa characteristically takes this very seriously, right? So um, if Philippa, as Philippa writes, Jackass becomes a humorous and abstracted theatre of being a heterosexual adult male circa 2001, um, then it's this amazing device for exploring this whole kind of array of ideas of what it is to have a body, um, the relationship between freedom and control, um, new forms of spectatorship that are produced, ideas of ritual, ritual's relationship to cruelty, um, complicated desire, beauty, subjugation, ideas of suffering, um, agency, and, and uh, all in relation to really important ideas of sickness and health. Um, I, you'll hear from Philippa shortly, sorry, I've prepared a response, I feel like it's the, it's the, it's the thing to no, do. No, it's great, it's a lot to live up to, but like they, <laughs> they didn't pay for the tickets, so they can't ask for their money back, but they don't live up to it. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, the, the, when I was reading the book, I was thinking about the ways in which, like, the necessity of violence and bearing witness to violence has been theorised in lots of different ways throughout the 20th century. Um, you know, you can think about someone like Franz Fanon, who would argue for the necessity of violence in, um, you know, decolonial settings. Um, you've been very, kind of amazingly and rightfully compared, I know, in, in reviews of, of, the, of the book to Susan Sontag, who, who a great accolade, um, you know, but who's very um, celebrated book regarding the pain of others is a, is a kind of great contribution to, to thinking about um, violence and, and spectatorship and, and suffering. Um, there are strands of feminist theory that attribute systemic and structural violence as basic characteristics of patriarchal capitalism, right? that it's violence that leads to subjugation at, at work or, in, or at home in the domestic space. But what's very interesting, which Philippa points to, is the way in which America is founded on a kind of colonial genocide, which, you know, and, it, and it's the place in which there is a kind of perfection of forms of violence. And Philippa notes in her book, citing Calvin Tompkins, the importance uh, for all of us, but the importance of, of the book itself and Philippa's project for continuing to really scrutinise masculinity and violence. And so, you, you know, there's this wonderful bit where you say, following Tompkins, to leave it unstudied would risk it becoming naturalised, that it somehow might render it less permeable to change. Um, in Philippa's book, there are acts of violence performed by people on themselves, self-injury. Um, there are acts of violence performed on others in loving relationships, within the context of loving, trusting relationships. Um, and these are also often carried out within the framework of a thing called art. Um, so in these kind of performative spaces, one of violence's jolting values, I think, when you read the book that's really quite striking, is, is this idea that you know, it, it, might, it might function to encourage us to think beyond established structures into maybe risky or irrational erotics of desire. And it might work from the personal to reimagine systems and structures of violence. And I think that what, one of the things that's so kind of compelling and brilliant about this book as, as you move into kind of towards the end of, end of the book in particular, where you address this, is the way in which some of these kind of historically marginal practices are kind of let loose into the worlds of YouTube and, and enter into the world in, in a very different setting. Um, and so I sort of finished the book thinking about the internet um, in quite a kind of um, particular way. You know, the internet has really enmeshed a kind of Anglo-American visual culture sensibility where we can encounter so much real shit online while also continuing to be a kind of spectator of the kind of violence, you know, that we see elsewhere, such as in Ukraine, this comes to mind. And I think that in, in recent times, certainly um, post-Trump, you know, time, our recent times have been characterised by a lack of care, right? And we only need to look at things like toy policies, for example, to, to see a really clear example of this, you know, in this kind of memorable T-shirt that Ivanka Trump wrote water a, a, um, a migrant centre that said, I don't care, on, on the back. So it's really interesting to me to think about the ways in which Philip is writing about violence in the context of this moment where care is, is sort of suddenly on the agenda in, a, in an important way. 
nearly done. Philippa doesn't discuss in depth um, the kind of increased violence meted out by extremist positions in society at large and and the way I think that the masculine body in crisis has really become a kind of locus for the far right in different ways, interesting ways. And although I think the book touches on it, I think it kind of, it deals with more kind of granular, specific aspects of the culture and art that you're kind of addressing. So, you know, it doesn't do this thing, which I really appreciate, of kind of popular theoretical platitudes. Um, I think that it kind of, one of its great qualities that is that it applies a kind of curious, particularising, journalistic eye to really complex subjects and, and pays close attention to those subjects. So, you know, and I think because of that, it does function as a kind of roadmap for thinking about these broader questions of, of uh, societal questions um, of the kind of presence of violence. Anyway, nearly there. Yesterday, um, I received a phone call from Philippa, um, who was very amused at the idea of um, how I was going to frame this book in relation to East Anglia. Um, <laughs> Philippa is a, a writer of, of, of brilliance and um, a writer who is, is just beginning. This is the first of, of many books, I'm sure. Um, and she's also based in Norwich. Um, and that, and that's, all, <laughs> that's, all the, that's all we need. Yeah, I was concerned uh, about that, but you really brought it home there. I think, <laughs> you know, really East Anglia um, so lucky us. Um, I'm promoting a hat this evening. Um, I am a kind of um, speaking um, hat rack. Yeah, my publisher has decided, despite all the controversy about Sally Rooney's hat, um, <laughs> to do a promotional hat for the book. Uh, if anyone wants to buy it, you can get it through Everpress. That's, that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay. And I feel slightly dirty having said that, but there we go. We, we just need four more purchases and then it goes to, into production. So if you, if you feel inclined to support the hat, I think you should um, go to the, the back at the end uh, of, of, of this evening. Um, so I think you're going to read from the book. I've prepared some questions. Yes. Um, yes, I kind of think you should interview yourself about my book after that because nah, you seem to not. understand it better than I do. But um... Do we need to... So, I think also we should just, we were sort of discussing this, um, there are themes of sexualized violence. I don't think anything that I'm reading is that hairy, but when you, the moment you said the words vomit omelette, I was like, we should have done a trigger warning for this. So trigger warning slightly for everything, really, in this book. Uh, much more if you read it, I think the sections that I read from are not going to be too bad. So shall I kick off? Please do. So just to contextualise, the book is in four sections actually weirdly i think of it as like one essay in four sections but nobody else does so i kind of let go of that idea now right. uh so the first one is about um kind of why people have the motivation to uh, enact kind of self-harm for ultra entertainment the second one's about gender the third one's about humor and the fourth one is about the idea of death as an art form um so the first bit that i'm going to read is from the gender section when the filmmaker, genius and pig Roman Polanski filmed Repulsion, a psychological horror about the torture inherent in being blonde, desirable and female, the cinematographer Gil Taylor famously objected to the treatment of its star Catherine Deneuve. I hate doing this to a beautiful woman, he insisted, as if beautiful suffering women did not make up about 80% of the movie industry to say nothing of Polanski's own filmography. But then Deneuve's beauty is her most immediate and objective character trait, the film writer Greg Quick pointed out in 2015. Viewers don't want to see bad things happen to, or because of, a beautiful woman, and yet Polanski and Deneuve play off the perverse desires of straight male viewers. A little over 20 years ago, in 1999, the critic Sally Vincent criticised Deneuve for majoring in those kinds of Madonna whore roles that have helped consign women's sex lives to the tiresome exercise of being hauled on and off pedestals by gentlemen who, in any case, needed little encouragement with their emotional aberrations. The main thing she disagreed with when she saw Deneuve play sexy, self-injurious characters as she did in Repulsion or in Belle de Jour, was what she perceived as the cinematic insistence that what we are looking at is the archetypal woman's authentic depiction of the sadomasochistic parameters of the typical female psyche. She believed that Deneuve helped spread the popular idea, in other words, that women were sufferers inherently, self-motivated and perhaps even aroused by the experience, that we, as Picasso once said to his mistress Francois Gillot, are machines for suffering. In the 2012 documentary The Artist is Present, Marina Abramovich is seen preparing for, then executing, 
her 2010 performance of the same name, a durational experiment in which the artist sat for eight hours a day in perfect silence, and her audience lined up to sit opposite one by one in order to experience what she described as a piece that destroys the illusion of time. The work, which spanned almost three months, fast became cultish, a la mode. People who sat with her more than ten times formed their own club, the Guardian informed, and a group of New York artists gave out badges, I cried with Marina Abramovich, to those who had broken down before her. Inevitably and irritatingly, James Franco, an excellent actor and a less than stellar artist with an improbable number of degrees, sat with Abramovich for maybe 60 seconds, and in doing so briefly succeeded in transforming her performance into the James Franco show, his absurd Gucci model beauty scarcely adequately camouflaged by his dun-coloured fogeyish trainers and plaid shirt. Marina most powerful as Marina most simple, Marina as Marina, he wrote in a commemorative piece about her for Time magazine, nonsensically. I love the simple Marina, the powerful Marina, when the artist is present within her. More distracting still was a visit from the performance artist Ule, a Brambich's ex-lover and sometime collaborator, with whom she had cut professional and romantic ties in 1988, in what may be the most extraordinary extroverted breakup gesture in contemporary history, a synchronised walk from opposite ends of the Great Wall of China, culminating in a few dignified tears, a warm embrace, and 22 years of mutual radio silence. After they'd separated, Abramovich began buying designer clothes and invested in breast implants. You know, I was 40 years old, she shrugged to the New York Times in 2012. I heard that Ule made pregnant his 25-year-old translator. I was desperate. I felt fat, ugly, and unwanted, and this made a huge difference in my life. Ule, who died in 2020, aged as ruggedly and naturally as Abramovich has unnaturally, augmentedly, and smoothly, suggesting that he did not exactly share her desperation. Abramovich, now 74, does not look young, but looks impervious to wear, unlined, pale, black-haired, as hard and immovable as a marble statue. I think I might still love her, Ule tells the documentary's camera operator, sounding brittle in the way men tend to sound when they have made a terrible mistake, and I'm okay with this. In some ways, the scene in which Ule and Abramovich face off at the MoMA, smiling, crying, and then finally agreeing to join hands, is far less interesting than one where Ule talks about an earlier, similar work the two of them produced together, Night Sea Crossing, which consisted of a man and a woman sitting opposite each other in two chairs, motionless, silent, fasting. It was mainly about things that are tremendously disliked in Western society, Ule continues. Inactivity, inaction, is discredited. Silence is discredited, and fasting is discredited. So these are three things that could obsess people pretty much, especially when you went for many days inactive, silent, fasting, absolutely motionless, which is almost impossible. What makes the scene most memorable is his admission that he gave in before Abramovich did, blaming biology in lieu of his own lack of stamina. A woman, he assures us, can sit better than a man because of anatomy. Women are certainly on average more experienced in the art of going hungry than most men, whether or not they also happen to be better built to sit in chairs for longer periods of time. A great deal of the work Ule and Abramovich have made together is, in fact, reliant on the different ways that men and women fuck and socialise, coalescing into a kind of hermeneutics of heterosexuality. Perhaps their best-known and most reproduced work, Rest Energy, sees the two artists held in perfect balance by a bow and arrow, the bow primed in Ule's fingers, and the point of the arrow squarely aimed at Abramovich's beating heart. It was really a performance about complete and total trust, she later said, somewhat underestimating the degree to which it was about her powerlessness at the hands of her male lover, to say nothing of how much less resonant it would have been if the two genders were reversed. Rest Energy is about heterosexual sex and relationship dynamics as much as it is about the bond of trust, in the same way that 1976's Relations in Space, in which they ran nude at each other's bodies blindly until both were bruised and aching, literalised almost comically the supposed battle of the sexes. When they called the series May between 1976 and 1979 when they were both in love, Relation Works, Ule and Abramovich meant for the ship to be implied. When their relationship did work, it still adhered to more or less the same outdated gender rules as every other heterosexual couples, the bow controlling the arrow staying taut, but also never changing hands. Um, <clears throat> there's a wonderful um, phrase there, the her hermeneutics of heterosexuality, um, which, um, which I, I um, paused on when I was reading. I was really struck by that. Um, well, so many ways in to begin talking. Um, I, uh, I guess maybe... Let's talk about suffering. Let's talk about women's oh, suffering yeah. <laughs> to, to begin. Um, you, 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 in your discussion of Deneuve um, there, you cite Picasso, who talked about this idea of women as being machines for suffering. Um, and um, throughout the book, there's this kind of spectre of, of Roman Catholicism. And there's a quotation where, uh, we, well, you cite Eileen Miles, who talks, who's in 
writing and cool for you this idea of the impossibility of imagine of imagining a female Christ and um, Miles says that this has something to do with the idea that women's suffering is a meaningless display or might be a meaningless display um, and so I, I was wondering if you could you could say a bit more about this idea of um, women's propensity for suffering and um, in, yeah yeah uh, it's a big topic isn't it um <laughs> i think as i say in the introduction to the book uh obviously when i'm talking about men and women in this i'm talking about them in quite um deliberately reductive kind of gender essentialist terms because i'm writing as a straight cis woman um and especially because a lot of the male practitioners um of this art form like their work is so much about masculinity um i don't know that yeah, this idea of women as machines for suffering. I don't know that that's true, but I would say that what I found was that a lot of female practitioners who were making that kind of work tended to be turning things in on themselves um, or to be using uh, this idea of violence in order to make themselves maybe more vulnerable to an audience. Uh, you know, Marina Abramovich allowing an audience to threaten her with a gun or mm -hmm. um, Gina Payne sort of climbing the knife ladder, giving herself stigmata. Mm -hmm. um, there is this strange, almost kind of martyr-like or saint-like pattern um, in works of that kind of that era perhaps later when I talk about someone like Paige Jin who is the YouTube stunt woman it then becomes much more about exactly the same kind of thing that Jackass is about where the violence becomes more about kind of fun and liberation and entertainment so there is like a sort of chronological progression. But Paige Jin, because um, I, I, was, I wasn't aware of Paige Jin before reading the book but maybe you could tell us a bit about Paige Jin and they are a kind of... So Paige Jin is a YouTube stunt performer who is weirdly like one of the reasons I wrote this book I think because I became fascinated with her about god I don't know it was about 2016 2017 I think she started to go viral and what she does is falls over in very spectacular ways in public places um, often injuring herself quite badly often the um, the falls will be very staged so that they look a certain way there are some videos where she's very carefully coordinated her like outfit or appearance with the context so it, like it, it is something that she's obviously planning in detail even though it looks like a spontaneous act yeah. um, and I became interested in her at the time because I was kind of thinking which is the same thing I seem to always be thinking and it's one of the central questions of the book like in what way is this not an art form even if she doesn't see it um, right. in that way and I think seeing a woman doing that kind of stuff as opposed to the men on Jackass doing it was quite interesting and startling. And I think that a lot of the, um, I think a lot of what's compelling about that sort of work, I'm gonna call it work broadly as if it is art because I kind of think it is, um, has to do with this inherent value that's placed on women's bodies, on female flesh, um, particularly she's a very conventionally attractive woman and mm. there is this idea that you should be preserving the vessel um, because it has, it's like a form of currency almost, mm. Mm. Um, and so to damage it is like. I mean, like, this is fucking terrible. So I'm going to be almost quoting myself, but I wrote something recently about the Carolee Schneeman show, and I was saying mm. that mm. her beauty um, kind of played into the work because then when she was doing things that were radical or upsetting, it was this idea of being almost like the KLF burning a pile of money. You know, it's yeah, this. Yeah, yeah this saleable object that's being used in a completely unexpected way. Yeah, because I think in that part of the book you also contrast it with like Owen Wilson who has a, a crooked nose. Oh yeah, that's in the bit about Rad Girls. There was a female jackass, I don't know how many people right. know this in the room. It was called Rad Girls, I think it may only have had one season. Um, and their stunts were often related to being female in some way, so there was one where they boxed each other in wedding dresses and. Um, there was one where one of them pretended to be like a street reporter with a yeast infection. Yeah. Uh, it was like they were quite disgusting. But they used semolina, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. They yeah. put semolina in there. Yeah. Um, it was not popular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you account for the lack of popularity for that? Name? I mean, does that, does that, does that, is that an, an example of this I idea don't, of. I like, don't know. I yeah. don't know whether it was just. Uh, I mean, maybe if you did a female uh, style 
like a female stunt show of that style now it would be more popular are there because this is going to be sorry i can hear myself rambling and this is this is possibly just going nowhere but um i haven't seen the latest jackass film because i could not bring myself to see it because i was like what if there's something in it that would have made the book just completely click into place and yeah. it's going to drive me insane uh, but there's there's a woman in yeah. Jackass now, isn't there? Yes. What do you want to know? I saw it. I mean, I was stoned at the time. I don't know if I um, want to know anything. I just, I just <laughs> wanted confirmation that there was a woman. There was a woman, but there was a kind of moment in it where um, McGinley or someone was was touching her body and made this and touched her breast and made this joke about how they would be cancelled in a Me Too world for doing this. Um, so there was this kind of. A self awareness that was that was displayed yeah. in that, that which was um, kind of curious. Yeah, but there was a woman. In well, we really can do anything a man can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I just want to kind of come back to this sort of relation. I mean, you talked about Carly Schneeman, and I know you've just reviewed the big show that's that's on in London at the moment. But um, I wonder to what extent you were. Well, in the first chapter, there's this figure of Chris Burden, who is one of these bigger figures that yeah. looms, like Abramovich. Um, Burden, who shoots himself famously in a gallery and shuts himself in a locker. And, and I wonder to what extent you were conscious of trying to kind of um, do some excavation work or, or sort of rethink that, that canon of performance art from the 60s and 70s. I think it's something that, um, I think it's just something that's always interested me. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure why. I said, somebody else interviewed me the other day and I said that I feel like it has something to do with my being a millennial who is very much of the like rotten.com generation. Is anyone familiar with that website? A couple of people nodding, yeah. Um, I, know, I, I don't know what it is. So, so it was a website uh, that basically compiled really repulsive oh. images crime scene photography and stuff yeah, like that, yeah. that was a huge deal on the internet at the time, probably around the time that I first had very basic access to the internet as like a sort of 12 year old. Um, and I wonder how much of that interest in extremity comes from the sudden availability of extremity on the internet. Yeah. Um, but also I think it's, it's the masculinity of it, I guess, that I find interesting. It's so completely alien to my way of looking at the world and my experience mm -hmm. but um the but i think specifically with jackass just to kind of move from the 70s hyper masculine performance art but one of the things that you observe about jackass is that the display of masculinity sort of tips into a kind of self-awareness a kind of performative masculinity definitely which... yeah um and i think that's one of the most interesting things about jackass it's also often quite homoerotic but in a completely unembarrassed way um and in that sense it's very different from i was going to say very different from chris burden's work not that chris burden's work is about him interacting with other men but i mean this idea that the sort of outlines of what being a man is become slightly more sort of porous and amorphous and um, it becomes about almost like a form of drag, almost like a like a cis men performing the drag of being cis men, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, the, this kind of links back to the question I was asking you about, like to what extent you were trying to um, revisit or rethink the kind of canon of performance art for it. One of the things that's very striking about your writing um, and I think there's a kind of great quality about it is this sort of dizzying collision of lots of different material and so um, you do this thing that's so brilliant you know when essays are done well and you know you're very good at doing this um, just plugging stuff in together and just seeing what the fuck happens you know so um, there's all this kind of there's this way in which you take seriously the, the, the stuff that kind of you know might be consigned to the kind of dustbin of kitsch or like you know piss pants funny clickbait stuff from the web that like but you take all that stuff seriously and so um I, I wonder if you could talk us a bit about like your method if you like for for arranging all of this material together because i sort of think uh, i'd love to see your bookmark structure on your browser <laughs> oh it, it's hell it's absolutely hell i have way too many tabs all the time um yeah i, I suppose i suppose when i'm writing um I'm often more interested in, rather than a single subject, 
uh, I guess I like pairing subjects. I like it's it is that puzzle thing of putting two perhaps slightly unusual things together. Right. So you're absolutely right um, to to notice that this idea of rescuing stuff from the dustbin of kitsch. Um, it's partly because uh, I think that populist things which are being looked at and dissected and loved or hated or by an enormous percentage of the population surely have the potential to be extremely revealing about mm. the opinions and feelings of a large part of the population mm. and uh, bite into that become worthy of analysis if you're trying to extrapolate something about society or culture or um, in the same way if, if not more so than stuff that's made for a very select audience that has a particular education, mm, art education. Mm, mm. Um, also, I guess I don't have an academic background, so I feel like, in some ways, maybe I feel I'm a little bit consigned to that dustbin of kitsch as well, like <laughs> coming, coming at it from an outsider's perspective. And, um, I don't really connect with the kind of international art speak, like I, I don't have a art history background or it's all just kind of feeling stuff out and um, mm. So I guess it's natural that I would go for populist stuff. Mm, mm. Um, this idea of like a, a, a kind of collapsing of high and low, which in a way feels like a straw man, because because my experience of being online most of the time is that these things are incredibly fluid. And, yeah. You, know, but, um, you, you mentioned that you know there's this kind of relationship you're really interested in between what it, where art begins and ends and where entertainment begins and ends and I you said that this was a kind of an animating idea at the beginning of the, the project and then you were looking at yeah. the uh, Insta famous um, whose name I can't remember the Instagram model. patient oh patient yeah, yeah. Uh, having written the book uh, <laughs> can you what have you discovered I mean do you <laughs> You're basically have you asking. Have you clarified your thinking around this relationship between art and uh, entertainment? Like, and maybe... You're sort of asking me, like, what is art? Which I feel like is <laughs> maybe too big a question for, for me. Um, I suppose I haven't. Do you know what? Uh, I, I wrote a quote down on my phone earlier, which had to do with also, it's funny you mentioned the religious threads um, in the book, which we can get to in a minute as well. I guess that's a whole other kettle of fish but um yeah so I read um after writing the book I read uh do people know priest daddy the Patricia Lockwood memoir you do because I made you read it uh, <laughs> at the same time um and there's a moment in that where she's talking about the experience of seeing her sister singing in church um and she says I knew it was art because it drew the senses slightly out of my body and they leapt to meet the art in the middle of the air I've never written, written a sentence that good, so I thought I would read that <laughs> instead um, to try and explain, I guess, what makes something art to me, maybe. It's having a, a particular reaction to it. I mean, it could be yeah. an extreme emotional reaction. It could be a reaction where I immediately think that it has something to teach me about a particular phenomenon or a particular kind of facet of human yeah. behaviour. That's the only answer I have for you, Johnny. And I feel like... <laughs> but one thing... Sorry. You... I was just going to say, like, I think I quote Tolstoy defining art in right. the book, and, and he's still not entirely sure, so... Um, <laughs> I wouldn't like but, to suggest I knew better. Okay. Um, but, I mean, one of the things... One way of thinking about uh, um, how to define art is the, uh, is the, the institutional theory of art, right? That, like, the institutions that surround art are what validates it as art and that it's not some essential quality. Yeah. So, but actually one of the things that recurs throughout the book is you thinking through what the institutions of art permit, which is different to, you know, the space of YouTube and what that permits. Yeah. And, um, and so, for instance, there are certain kinds of... I mean, I think it's right through the book, there are certain kinds of behaviours that can only take place and be permitted to take place within within the settings of, of contemporary art. So um, so I, I suppose, um, how do I make that into a question? I, I guess I'm sort of interested to, to, if we think about it through that lens, if you think about it specifically in relation to that, I mean, it's also what makes Marina Abramovich such, like, game for comedy and pastiche. Yeah. 
right? Because it seems to me that part of her, quite a lot of Abramovich's behaviour is permitted through this kind of space of, of the institutions of contemporary art. I'm sort of answering the question. I'm posing the question. This is what sorry, I said. You sorry, should be interviewing no, yourself no, about the book. No. And... Do you want to read something else? Uh, yeah, if you'd like me to. Yes, I, I know you wanted me to read the bit about uh, a little video called British Lads Hit Each Other With Chairs. <laughs> um, and in fact, that is the bit where I introduced Paige Jim as well, actually, so that's okay. quite convenient. Great. Um, I'm sorry to be constantly licking my lips and drinking water, guys. I have long COVID and it gives me a very dry mouth. Hopefully the microphone's not going to pick it up. Culturally, there is something shocking in the image of a woman choosing to destroy what is supposedly, which is to say misogynistically, her most valuable asset, her own flesh. If seeing the inside of a good-looking blonde woman on the internet no longer holds much shock value, it's arguable that some shock remains when that inside is the inside of her left arm. Paige Jim, a sunny, pretty, leggy girl from San Diego, has achieved renown online for faking violent falls in very public places, at in and out and at the mall, at Walmart or the bowling alley, in a way that alarms and delights her fans in equal measure. On May 26, 2016, she shared a photograph on Instagram of the skin stripped from her forearm by a tree branch, the interior of her body flashing crimson. Bush 9,273,000, page zero, she wrote in the caption, perhaps more casually than one might expect given the severity of the injury, adding, hashtag time for life insurance. As with Johnny Knoxville, Jin's obvious attractiveness is intended to add seasoning to the joke. Both of them are toned and tanned in enviable opposite sides of the same hot coin. In a clip where Jin falls helplessly inside a laundromat, her perfect legs fly out akimbo like a Barbie being used nefariously by a perverted, precocious five-year-old. On the beach, she flings herself out of a boat and onto land in booty shorts so minute that the end result resembles a cross between a crossfit ad, a skit performed by Buster Keaton, and a pornographic take on Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. In the in-and-out set clip, she coordinates her outfit and her wig to the ketchup and mustard colours of the outlet's famous logo, making herself an eye-catching logo too, a capitalist symbol and a piece of living pop art, maybe unwittingly drawing parallels between the casual consumption of white girls who might once have been sorority sisters and the casual consumption of fast food. The jackass boy's suggestion that no chicks ought to be harmed in the making of their TV shows and movies seems far quainter after watching Paige Jin's videos than it did when Rad Girls aired. Obviously, it is clear in 2022 that women should be doing whatever they feel like doing with their bodies, whether they feel, what they feel like doing is dieting or getting fat, having children or remaining staunchly childless, getting plastic surgery or getting fit or getting borderline concussed as a result of hurling themselves headlong into 10 or 15 storage boxes in a Walmart. There is something more punk, though, more possessed to reveal the zorious air of violence and accordingly more dangerous and free, about gin stunts in particular than there was about the costume scripted MTV skits orchestrated by the Rad Girls. Here, one thinks, watching her videos on YouTube, is a woman who would probably agree with Hunter S. Thompson's assertion in the voicemail that he left for Johnny Knoxville that the words violence and fun can be synonymous, the rush of being hurt but not being irreparably damaged, something like the rush of drugs or sex or love. Nothing by the Rad Girls ever feels as pointless and accordingly as giddy as a compilation of Jin's best falls from 2013 to 2018, a five-year project with no aim, no purpose, no narrative, and no obvious financial gain for its creator. America loves a tomboy who still looks like a Victoria's Secret model, an Olivia Munn or a circa 1967 Goldie Horn, but there are limits. It is considered bad form to break or scar the merchandise. Vice magazine, a cultural touchstone Jin might be a little too young to be familiar with, once ran a photograph of what it used to call its do's and don'ts, of a beautiful young woman at a party, passed out after drinking one too many beers. When women get all weekend at Bernie's, the male caption writer groaned, it's just not right, it's like she fell asleep at the vagina and that makes all mother's sons feel uncomfortable. The writer's fear being for the woman's hypothetical unborn son and not her safety, picturing her as the designated driver of her reproductive system and not as an actual person, is not terribly surprising when one considers the caption's provenance. It will have been either edited or authored by the right-wing talking head Gavin McInnes, who progressed from being a co-founder of Vice to being the founder of the Proud Boys. Still, it perfectly encapsulates an irritatingly pervasive attitude towards the bodies of desirable young women, whose fertility and reproductive history are considered to be matters of general public interest. Jin, to expand on the embarrassing sexist vice analogy, is not so much asleep behind her body's wheel as she is steering it with the insane abandon of a seasoned rally driver, open-eyed and screaming, joyriding, crashing into barriers in order to experience the sick, effulgent pleasure of brushing up against death. 
just as adroit at upending sexual and social stereotypes, is a mysterious one-minute clip added to YouTube in 2016, with the eloquently self-explanatory title, British Lads Hit Each Other With Chair. Four boys, aged somewhere between 17 and 23, are standing in the concrete backyard of a typical suburban home somewhere in Britain, quivering with the nervous energy of thoroughbreds before a race. One is shirtless and another is in nothing but a pair of jogging shorts. Both are fit, but in the manner of a labourer or a builder rather than a gym rat, softened slightly by what one has to imagine as a steady flow of booze. The boy without a shirt goes first, having to swig wine from a bottle and then dash it, showily and dumbly, on the ground to build his courage. <laughs> the boy wearing only shorts, moving with the eager fluidity of a Looney Tunes cartoon, lifts a folding chair above his head. What follows, the first boy being clobbered until he is on the ground, a third boy sweeping in to take a beating, the first boy returning determinedly to starting position, and then being beaten until he is on the ground again, would be considered unremarkable in the pantheon of copycat jackass stunts, if it were not for the pervasive, intense air of homoeroticism colouring the entire chaotic stunt, in particular the video's first seconds. Before the ensuing violence, the two nearly naked men lean in, and as if this were something they did frequently, exchange a soft, delicate kiss. It is a kiss as casual and honourable as a handshake, an assurance from the one man to the other that whatever may transpire, he will not come to irreparable harm. Letting lips do what hands do, both participants appear to make a contract. Later in the video, when the first boy is on the ground after the second round of pain, the other keeps the promise made by that earlier kiss by cradling him, pieta-like, the two men touching skin to skin. The willing victim seems to have experienced a transformative agony, his breathlessness and wide eyes closer to an erotic obsession than a hurt one. That's ridiculous, he repeats twice, before another male voice somewhere off screen offers an amazed sounding corrective. That's fantastic. <laughs> to read an intentional statement about gender roles into the porny atheistic passion play of British lads hit each other with chair is more or less as ludicrous as doing so with one of Paige Jin's compilations of her various falls. Still, art can be an accident, and it is undeniable that both of these artefacts, especially paired, express a truth about the use of injury and agony as a conduit for escaping, or at least gratuitously fucking with, the gender binary. A body in immense pain can feel genderless, its status is a site of hurt more meaningful in the white-hot and blinding torrent of sensation, brought on by a punch or a kick or a cut, than its official designation as a body that is sexed. Bloody brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's just brilliant. Um, oh, so many questions. Um, um, it's, it's very fucking funny. Thank you. <laughs> Guys, you um, can laugh if you want to. I'm, I'm worried that everyone thinks that I'm like very seriously analysing British lads hit each other with chair. And I am, but I'm also not. There was a bit also that really made me laugh about Bob Flanagan eating a salami and then you making an analogy between the salami of the... Flanagan was eating as it's, a it's weirder than that Johnny it's that he's on a, he was on a TV show as a child yes. and the host of the television show in the clip says that um, an audience member is going to give a piece of artwork in exchange for a salami but there's no context <laughs> because the clip is from like 1957 <laughs> so we just have to kind of guess what it's about but you then use salami as a euphemism I do yeah I do. Penis. I do. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of stuff you're getting in here guys if you want. it's the kind of sophisticated art <laughs> critique that I'm capable of um, you've been called an acerbic Wit recently, you were delighted by this. I think secretly. Um, what, what does what does what does the comic register enable you to do as a writer? Um, I mean, I guess I guess on this subject, like it would not be an original observation to say that it makes it far easier for people to digest material that is fundamentally about death and pain and um, kind of psychological turmoil. But also, I. I can never really connect with writers and to some degree sort of artists as well who don't have just a little bit of humour in their work. doesn't need to be kind of laugh out loud funny, mm. but maybe uh, a bit deadpan or just a slight sense of the absurd. I think taking yourself too seriously, like that, I would not want people to think that I took myself completely seriously. And I think it's this thing of... Um, like it's such a hackneyed kind of the F. Scott Fitzgerald quote like the mark of a first rate intelligence is being able to hold two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember what it is but um, it's important that um, that when I'm analysing material like that YouTube video I want the reader to know that I'm aware of how insane it is that I'm doing that um, but I am also taking it seriously and I'm kind of saying Yes, I am mad, but also go with me here and see what we find out together. Yeah. 
but the, the so there's two things there to kind of pick up on with this this kind of sense of like um, the madness of of self injury. I mean, not just your madness for taking this stuff seriously, which I think is not so mad. Um, I think it's a wonderful quality. Um, but one of the things that you touch on through the book is this idea that um, is the way in which, like, to set to, to injure oneself, to 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 be involved in self injury, actually. Um, is very quickly assumed to be insane or crazy behaviour yeah. or perverted. And you you lean into that. I mean, there's bits where you, you try to... It's like there's a word that you use quite a lot in the book, which is perverted. But you, you seem to use it in a particular kind of way that um, celebrates it as a, as a quality. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that says more about me and who I am as a person than it does about the book. What does it most... say about you? Um, as, um, as a person and, and how are you trying to use it in this, I, in this I don't know that I self-identify as a pervert perhaps <laughs> I think um, I think it is a great quality I think I mean I talk a little bit about John Waters in the book and I think you would struggle to find a better example of an artist who is perverse um, can you tell but, us a bit about John Waters? Oh, John Waters is a filmmaker, a queer filmmaker. Everyone here knows who John Waters is, right? Everyone's nodding, so oh, right. I don't need to. But <laughs> we're fine, we're fine. Um, yeah, I mean, he comes up because of the connection with Johnny Knoxville, obviously. But also it's this thing of... Um, my, in fact, weirdly, my mum likes to use the phrase the imp of the perverse, this kind of... Uh, the imp? Yeah. I'm not sure, actually, I'm not sure where it comes from. I'm going to walk that back, because I saw you oh, wincing. It's, it's Poe. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to explain what it refers to? I can't to? remember what it is. <laughs> it's, uh, oh, fuck. it's one of Poe's stories about a self-destructive character who says that he's been kind of um, uh, possessed by the end of the perverse. And it, it's, it's a kind of position which uh, glories in its own destruction, right? Yeah, there we go. Um, and kind of existing counter to something, but in a gleeful sort of way, I guess. There you yeah. go. That's yeah. what I would say was perverse, I guess. Um, so the so it was you were consciously trying to kind of reclaim this term then in the book yeah, I guess so. and sit with it. Yeah. Um, so just to come to come back round to um, the idea of humour. Um, so it's clearly a device for you uh, it's also very entertaining for the reader um, is there something fundamentally funny about self-harm I wouldn't say there was something inherently funny about it um, it, de it depends because obviously slapstick is essentially a form of, of self-harm and obviously I write quite a lot about Buster Keaton uh, in the book and there was an unrealised harmony Korean project called Fight Harm I don't know how many people know about that, but the concept being that he would just start fights with people in the street, often people who were much larger with him, mm. that frequent than him. Mm. Um, and it was this idea that uh, if slapstick humour and seeing a man sort of fall down or get beaten up was, in his mind, the pinnacle of humour, that amplifying it by doing it so many times, one after the other for real, would, he thought, create the ultimate comedy film basically. Um, in practice it never got made because he was so badly injured so many times that it became untenable. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose self-harm in the form of slapstick is, is funny. And, and other, in other situations maybe the humour is there to cope with the fact that it's not particularly. Yeah. You, you, um, you allude in that reading to um, Thompson, Hunter S. Thompson. The voicemail, yeah. And the, the title is from a quotation we, we learn very quickly. Um, it is, in. yeah. So can you tell us a bit more about the link between, because it seems to me actually in that first chapter you're trying to, you're sort of, you're sort of excavating a cross-generational relationship between Knoxville and Hunter S. Thompson. But yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, so Johnny Knoxville was a huge fan of Hunter S. Thompson. Um, they ended up having the chance to meet and Hunter S. Thompson eventually kind of adopted him as a sort of, uh, I don't know, almost anointing him like a kind of successor, I guess. Mm. Uh, the title of the book comes from a voicemail that Hunter S. Thompson left for Johnny Knoxville where he said, um, I'll be coming to Baton Rouge and I'll be looking to have some fun. Uh, which, as you know, means violence. 
Um, and I used it as the title because it's just such a fantastic idea, I think, that these two men have this understanding that those two things are synonymous, which exists so much outside of what you would think of as the usual understanding um, of things. And I think Hunter S. Thompson and Johnny Knoxville both share that, again, that um, very American, very masculine kind of attitude to risk. Mm -hmm. And obviously Hunter S. Thompson's work was much more overtly political. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would imagine he saw something political in Johnny Knoxville's work as well, mm, maybe. Mm, mm. You use Thompson also to sort of do some groundwork for like a sort of cultural, social, affective setting for the world in which Knoxville grew up in. Yeah. Um, can you talk us through that a, a bit? Uh, I mean, I could find the quotation would probably make the most sense because uh, he is describing the generation particularly. Because mm. it's quite a striking moment where, I mean, I, I did allude to this in my introduction, but this this sort of generational um, chasm, if you like, between the Nam era and the 9-11, or what came after that and then the 9-11 era. So, yeah, so he was writing uh, in the 80s and talking about uh, HIV and acid rain, basically. Uh, this is Hunter S. Thompson. And he said, what do you say about a generation that has been taught that rain is poison and sex is death? If making love might be fatal and if a cool spring breeze on any summer afternoon can turn a crystal blue lake into a puddle of black poison right in front of your eyes, there's not much left except TV and relentless masturbation. It's a strange world. Some people get rich and others eat shit and die. Um, and I guess he's talking about the generation that Johnny Knoxville grew up in. Um, mm -hmm. This kind of almost a dead-end feeling of American masculinity and I although I, I mean I talk about how although Jackass started just before 9-11 it feels like an oddly kind of post 9-11 show um, like a show that reflects this idea of a sort of distant American war in the same way that something like Chris Burden's work is supposed to reflect Vietnam in a similar kind of way mm, mm, mm. Um, and um, I think also what's quite striking th throughout the book is a kind of way in which um, you do this kind of excavation of popular media. So that you know, so you've talked. Thompson refers to the Vietnam War, this kind of twenty-four hour broadcast. You know, the first kind of mediated war. Um, Knoxville comes up through a kind of um, skate culture, you know, tapes that maybe are given out with skateboard magazines. You allude to this kind of period in the 80s of a kind of sensation around video nasties. And there's always this, you allude a couple of times to the, the, the sort of snuff movie. Yeah. Which is this kind of um, illicit thing that, you know, is, is shared. And then, of course, we get to YouTube. Yeah. And so there's also this kind of media archaeology that you do and you think about the ways in which certain kinds of spectatorship are produced through those things. Um, I wonder, I mean, is that something that you were uh, aware of um, as you were writing it? And can you talk to, to kind of tell us a bit about that? It's a terrible question, I'm very sorry. Um, what about the progression towards? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, like, the awareness of video nasties, for instance, or, you know, because also what, what was one of the kind of moral panics that surrounded that was this idea of copycat behaviour. Um, yeah, um, and there was a similar kind of copycat fear with Jackass as well. Um, I don't know, it's quite hard to talk about this kind of thing and not sound too old man yells at cloud about it. Right. But I suppose there is, um, as I was saying about the Rotten.com thing, the ease of production uh, and the ease of access yeah. uh, of every form of media, every kind of video now, um, I suppose allows the spread, the further spread of more extreme material, the production of more extreme material. Mm -hmm. um, it also makes it very easy for people who want to do stunts uh, or enact other forms of self-harm on the internet to uh, disseminate that yeah. to other people. And because there is an impulse to look at violence, um, it's seen by a lot of people. 
But one of the things that you also explore is the way that it, it becomes an economy, it becomes a, a yeah. means to escape poverty for some people. Yeah. Well, there's the um, uh, Pedro Ruiz, the YouTube performer um, that I mentioned at the end, who was shot by his pregnant fiance um, because he was trying to do a stunt for YouTube where he had a book on his chest and she fired a gun at him. Um, and he talked about how he was doing it because they didn't have any money and it was a way to make money. Mm. Um, and then similarly, I talk about the YouTube video of Logan Paul finding the corpse in the suicide forest yeah um and the fact that he ran he edited and ran the video he recorded an introduction that was supposed to be kind of appropriately somber for it but it was still monetized yeah can you read that part is that i is was that, uh, yeah i can it's a kind of neat way um, how are we doing for time so just i don't know do people know who logan paul is i barely know who logan paul is but <laughs> i should probably contextualize it so he's like a YouTube celebrity who has a podcast. Um, but he's one of those people who is incredibly famous to younger people, but means almost nothing to people who are my age, I guess. Do you know what I mean? There's like a whole new class of celebrity that exists now that I'm just too old to understand. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, so this is the bit about the YouTube video. As is often true with contemporary art, the final taboo may not end up being broken in a gallery, but online. Videos of actual death, ISIS beheadings, the televised suicide of our Bud Dwyer in the Senate in the 80s, videos made by the Canadian serial killer Luther Magnotta, etc, etc, have been circulated on the internet for as long as most millennials and Gen Zs have had access to it, making the bizarre 2018 incident with the young idiotic YouTuber Logan Paul a little less surprising, albeit no less miserable or dystopian than it might otherwise have been. Filming in the Akagiara Forest in Japan, an area known for being the site of frequent suicides, Paul came across a human body, and rather than abandoning what was meant to be an entertaining video, made the psychopathic choice to move in closer with the camera, obviously nervous, but just as aware that death, like sex, can be extraordinary for ratings. His reaction to the scene reads as profoundly inauthentic, although whether this is due to his having adopted the specific mannerisms of a YouTube vlogger, in which recognisable facial expressions are reduced to a broad cartoonish semaphore, is not quite clear. He looks as if a Disney prince has been drawn seeing a dead body for the first time, all huge eyes and grasping hands. This is a first for me, says Paul, nodding vaguely at the corpse. It's definitely a first for me. I'm sorry about this. This was meant to be a fun blog. Suicide is not a joke. The latter observation does not jive exactly with the fact that he's using it as content for a YouTube video for a teenage audience, and feels even less believable in light of his delivering his stirring monologue wearing a hat shaped like the alien from Toy Story. I don't feel very good, one of his crew says, sounding nauseous, and Paul, seeming to forget what he has just said about suicide not being very funny, says sarcastically, what, you've never stood next to a dead guy, and then laughs. Morally, Logan Paul's video is repulsive. Culturally, it is fascinating for its casual depiction of real death, not contextualised in the hysterical and sensationalist mode of a Mondo film, but in the half-baked quasi-therapeutic language of most contemporary click uh, coverage of trauma, pain, and violence. This is not clickbait, this is the most real vlog I've ever posted on this channel, Paul says, in a solemn introduction to the clip that uses real and too discreet and possibly opposing senses, real in the sense of keeping it, invoked to suggest to his audience that he is not being exploitative, but simply and accurately reporting on a serious and pertinent issue, and real in the more literal sense that no part of the human experience captured authentically on camera, even sex, is as conspicuous for being real as death itself. Perhaps more interestingly still, Paul immediately circles back and in the parlance of art criticism, revokes his suggestion of the real to invoke the surreal. This is the most circumstantially surreal thing that has ever happened to me in my life, he says, the four-syllable word and the art historical one revealing that he either prepared or had prepared for him a script. Surrealism, per the writer Andre Breton, is defined as pure psychic automatism, by which one proposes to express, either verbally, in writing, or by any other manner, the real functioning of thought, making the image of a YouTuber stumbling on the body of a suicide an accidentally perfect example of the movement's legacy. In this unorchestrated meeting, as beautiful as Breton might say, quoting the Comte de Lautremont, as the chance encounter of an umbrella and a sewing machine on an operating table, between a flesh and blood representative of meaningless and brainless entertainment, and a flesh and blood reminder of mortality, what emerges as a metaphor for the intrusion of the idea of death into even our most lightweight attempts to distract ourselves from our own fragility. It fits to David Foster Wallace's conception of the Lynchian, a descriptor often used interchangeably with surreal. A particular kind of irony where the very macabre and the very mundane combine in such a way as to reveal the former's perpetual containment within the latter. The Lynchian is this weird confluence of very dark, surreal, violent stuff, Wallace later clarified on Charlie Rose, 
and absolute almost not Norman Rockwell banal American stuff. Did you watch this video? Uh, yes, to write this section, I did. And and how many how many followers does Logan Paul have? Oh God, do? an enormous amount. As I say, it, it is a world that kind of exists outside my experience, but he's Isn't very he popular. Well? He is now, yeah. Mm-hmm. MMA. So I think he's a, he, he either commentates or fights in MMA now. Yeah, he's I think he does, yeah. He's a fight, yeah, he's fighting. He's apparently quite surprisingly good at it, so he shouldn't be good at it at all. Or at least he's not losing. Maybe he's just he's carrying on starting fights with people who are bigger than him and seeing if he wins. Yeah. Yeah. Did not know you'd have all the Logan Paul info. <laughs> 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 he fights a number of famous YouTubers in the KSI, and they have a trilogy for him. That's it. That's one of the big trends on YouTube. Like they keep all, they, they keep organising like boxing tournaments and lots of YouTube creators. And they they all go and they you know they play and they have videos where they're you know I'm gonna fight this guy and then I got beaten up by the other guy. Need writers to get involved in this sort of like. <laughs> Yeah, if anyone would like to suggest an opponent, then um, I'm open. Mark Tappert's open. <laughs> Um, the Logan Paul features in a chapter, the last chapter, which is also dealing with Bob Flanagan. Yeah. Who actually, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't really know much about as a, as a, as a, as an artist. Um, but Flanagan proposed to um, to make a, a video work, right? Install a live feed into their coffin. Yeah. And whilst they were, whilst they were dying, but Flanagan also kind of lent into this idea of being a super masochist and. Um, had this kind of memorable um, kind of aphoristic term of, of this idea of t- fighting sickness with sickness. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, if we, un- I mean, I guess one way of understanding perversity historically is that it's been framed as being a kind of sickness, um, only in, in the sense that it has a relationship to the idea of health. Um, but um, <clears throat> just to segue neatly into the context of writing this book, um, you wrote it during um, your own experience of sickness. I did, yeah. I, um, I'm sure almost everyone here knows that. But I don't know. I don't know. But um, perhaps I'm sort of interested to know whether you were tempted to, to write that experience into the book, whether that was something that you were kind of thinking about. And you didn't in the end, but then I, I wonder how it how it impacted on the kind of process of writing the book? Um, I did think about it. So what happened uh, was that I got COVID very early on with pre-vaccines in the first week of the first lockdown, and then I became very ill, and I remained very ill for quite a long time. Um, so I have long COVID still. I'm a lot better than I was because it's been two and a half years, but mm. um, I still have sort of symptom flare-ups where it just feels like I have COVID again, which is very frustrating, and I have fatigue and so on. It's quite hard to deal with. Um, but in really in the thick of the illness, uh, I thought about writing about it, but I thought it was situated so much in this moment. Um, also, I will say that the effect it had on it mainly was that it altered the way that my brain worked. Um, I was quite heavily affected by brain fog, and I would go through phases where I couldn't remember language, well, not language completely, but I mean words that I would lose words. Um, and become very forgetful and um, find it hard to kind of join up my trains of thought and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, But what that ended up doing, I suppose, was that I felt, first of all, I felt very in my body because I was in pain. Um, So I felt very aware of my physical self in a way that I might not have done Mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, And also it gave a strange sort of looseness to my thinking. made what I was doing slightly less rigid. Uh, A lot of it was written chronologically and um, I didn't really rewrite it very much. It just came out as almost like a stream of consciousness, Mm. which doesn't sound like a great advert for the book, so don't. (laughs) Um, But it was different from my normal style of writing, I suppose. And it felt as if I'd been untethered from something, from some sort of structure that normally kept me hemmed in. And that was kind of good kind of interesting and I read the manuscript afterwards and it was as if someone else had written it there was lots I did not remember having written at all mm-hmm. and um, I'm sort of curious about your kind of process of writing because this is 
is your first book. I mean, obviously, you know, you write and you publish frequently, but this is your first book. Um, um, did you write it? Did you kind of put other stuff aside and then and then focus on this and kind of write it in kind of intense period of time? Uh, I would kind of do it in bursts. So uh, I would do sort of a thousand words a day for a month or whatever. I would sort of build up some money from freelancing and then use that money to write the the next section of the book or whatever. So I was doing it around other things. Mm, mm, mm. Um, and um, bef before we kind of open up to, to questions, um, I understand that there's another book in the works. Is, is that something that you're willing to, to talk about? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, it's an essay collection uh, about famous women. Each essay will be about a pair of famous women. Uh, so there's one about uh, Nicole Smith and Marilyn Monroe. There's one about uh, Liz Taylor and Lindsay Lohan. Um, and it also has a really long title. It's called It's Terrible the Things I Have to Do to Be Me, which is a quote from Anna Nicole Smith. Well, fantastic. We look forward to it. <laughs> um, any questions? Just going to kind of turn it back on the floor. <laughs> oh, for God's sake! Yep, go on. Are you the person at the beginning of? The <laughs> I am. The I was no, no, no. Um, you touched on it, Johnny, but I think um, so. Pip, you say that like you were ill while you wrote it, and you were talking about the idea of Flanagan's kind of sickness versus sickness. Do you think that having written around these people and their the products of their artwork that are based around pain and suffering, and ultimately death? that you've either taken on board or confronted something yourself at the same time? Or is there, is there something that you gain from doing it that's, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you said, but for, for people listening to the audio recording, it's my partner of 10 years who's just asked a question. <laughs> um, you said when you read the book, for example, that you thought it seemed as if I was religious, uh, which I'm not. So I was obviously going through something at that time um, that I'm still I'm still not quite sure what happened there. I don't know if anyone else has taken that away from it. I'm sure you mentioned this earlier as well. I was struck by <clears throat> the extent to which certain artists w were in dialogue with their Roman yeah. Catholicism, but I also understood that as being a kind of generational thing because it's, you know, it's Waters who, you know, was born immediately post-war or whatever because I because I don't think that it's any of the YouTubers who are trying to come to terms no, with no. You know, um, the sin is, of self-harm it is or, now newly fashionable to be Catholic in America I don't know if you're aware of this it's like a big New York media trend um, but I'm getting away from answering your question um, yeah that suggests that I was reckoning with something to do with my mortality at the time I guess uh, has it changed my relationship with pain Probably not, was the disappointing answer. Um, I think maybe rereading it and talking about it, I might come to understand further things about myself and my relationship with my body and my mortality and so on. Um, but I, I don't have anything to tell you right now. The beauty of it is we live together, so I can tell you when you can But the, I, uh, sorry. No, no, I was, I was just gonna say, like at the very basic level, like, like when me and Joe talk about it yesterday, like the, there's so many bits of descriptions of artworks in there that make uh, uh, make one wince from from the sense of not wanting to um, to experience pain as a, yeah. as, a as a person. Um, but obviously, the, the the thing that you've zeroed in on is the the propensity for people to actually, you know, to, to gravitate towards. Conquering or, or going through that kind of thing, and I think that's I think that's really fascinating. I'm, I'm, it's, it's just a comment. Okay, more of a comment than a yes. question. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Oh yeah, this may be a general comment more than a question to you. I'm sorry, but uh, I was just struck by how you're talking about the, in the book. There's the chapter, the section on gender. And you had talked about Marina Abr Abramovich and she had the silent show. And it, it just reminded me of Yoko Ono in the 60s had a show called Cut, where she sat naked. Oh, yes, and, that's in the book as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you definitely put that. Um, and the idea that I kind of struck my mind is 
there were two female performance artists whose work invokes to a certain degree, well definitely with, your, with Ono and perhaps in, in to a degree with Abramovich, you mentioned she had a gun pulled on her as well. And I know that Yoko was also attacked when she did the cut show, yeah. where she sat down covered in shards of glass. And I guess, though, at least the Ono show, from my understanding of it, was a, a silent invocation of violence, or at least it, it brought up ideas of the, the female um, the female artists looking at violence or in, in involving her audience in thoughts around violence and how the so the show is a silent show. And in terms of the later period you talked about with Knoxville, etc., to me Jackass is a very loud show. It's all about the performative yeah. and the, the screaming, laughter and loudness of the male enthusiast of violence or violence of performance. And did you think did you think a lot about that while writing the section, this idea of in the Sontagian, if that's a word, um, conception of reacting to violence or thinking about violence and silence? Sorry, that those that sounded like a just rhyme, but I think there's something in the <laughs> idea of um, the female author looking or performing ideas or thoughts on violence silently versus the male jacked up, jackass, um, overtly loud conception of performing violence. I didn't think about that, and that's exactly the kind of more of a comment than a question that I love to receive because it was a fantastic point. <laughs> I have no, I have nothing further to add. Um, this one's more of a question than a comment, but I'm not sure how to frame it now that I'm speaking. But um, I don't know. One thing that struck me, just like of the sections that I've seen, and also you know, some some of the excerpts you've read, have been kind of I don't know. It's struck me as generally fascinating hearing these videos, which I have personally seen, you know, some of them a number of times. Well, I've never actually kind of questioned or really looked into the dialogue during them because it always, you know, because it's like it's unscripted. It's people kind of spontaneously or I don't know, sometimes more subconsciously reacting to things. But um, but here, but you know, seeing it kind of like written down or hearing it kind of like isolated in like a non jody accent is um, it's kind of interesting, and I, I wanted to. I'm curious if that was kind of part of the process to kind of like just take what is spoken um, away from the visuals and like, you know, whether there's some sort of, whether whether that kind of like joins back up at some point or whether it's kind of, um, there, there feels like much of a disconnect between what is said and what is happening. I think that's probably a reflex from the fact that I mainly write film criticism now where obviously you're recording a lot of dialogue as part of the analysis um, but also something like British lads hit each other with a chair for example um, there's very little dialogue in it but what's said um, the contradicting like I, and now I can't remember what they say so this is completely ruined the point that I was going to make um, there is a kernel of something interesting in there um, God, I'm fucking shit at this Q&A section because I, I have no idea how to answer that question either, really. Well, there weren't a comment then. It was, it was <laughs> fascinating to see. But there's something interesting because the, like, the, the, what links the Logan Paul and what links the British lads getting whacked by a chair is that there's an awareness of the presence of the camera. Yeah, very much so. You know, and the Logan Paul thing is so striking. And you do, you do note this. It's so striking for its banal, banality. You yeah, know. and the way that he's framing it in, as I say, this almost sort of therapy speak um, is, is deeply strange because he's applying a lot of the same tactics that I assume he applies to the creating the rest of his videos to yeah. it. Mm. Um, he knows exactly who his audience are and he must have thought, how do I contextualise this video of me coming across someone's dead body for a teenage audience? Mm. Um, mm. And as I say, presumably like pre-written a script to read, which is an extraordinary thing to think about. And I also wonder if there's any way of knowing how much money he made out of that video in particular. Mm. Because I assume I'm saying this again, not knowing how he, exactly how YouTube is monetized, but I presume that video must have had quite a lot of hits because it became a concern outside of his fan base. Mm. I don't know if you've I haven't read the book yet, I don't know if it's something you've mentioned, but I guess in the kind of post-Broughton.com era, I also grew up in high school, 
there was kind of the the rise of like fail videos as a thing. But and they were kind of I guess framed or existed on the internet in the same time as Jackass and that whole era. But came from a didn't come from a purposefulness of being made to fit that thing. I don't um a question rather. <laughs> that was a very meta way of transforming it into a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, those are kind of, they're like accidental slapstick, aren't they, mm. those sort of videos? Um, yeah. So the appeal of them is kind of eternal. It's as old as like a caveman laughing at another caveman falling over or getting kicked in the nuts, I guess. Mm. And so is Jackass, but um, mm. those kind of exist incidentally and completely at someone else's expense. Whereas I guess the, the thing about Jackass that makes it work for the book is this idea that it's this proactive sort of pain. Yeah. That's what makes it different. I guess maybe I was thinking like maybe Jackass kind of validates people posting failed videos. Yeah, I guess as, it does because humor. you know there's a, an audience yeah. for it. Um, yeah. What's, yeah. Your, um, what's your like YouTube generative like recommended videos <laughs> I, I, that sounds like completely a joke but it's not like entirely because uh, you know it used to be the case that you get recommended videos that similar to things you've watched but now sometimes they do a weird thing and they show you ones that kind of the opposite you know what I mean like th things that yeah. kind of try and like um, agitate your mm -hmm. I don't know like anger or this is going to make me sound like a serial killer, but I have my history turned off on YouTube, so it recommends me completely random things. So it will often be like a video from Britain's Got Talent, and then something of an influencer being interviewed, and I don't know, like a kitten falling into a bucket or whatever. Um, so actually, very benign. Uh, if I'd had my history turned on while writing this book, I dread to think what, what would have come up. Right. Say more about that. <laughs> say more about it? What yeah, more is there to say? Well, no, I mean, because you're talking about lo the logic of, of, of algorithmic recommendation yeah. on YouTube, right, which um, it very quickly leads to quite a dark place, right? And well, it just takes you down a rabbit hole, doesn't it? Um, I have to say I'm not someone who spent a lot of time just clicking related links on YouTube. I know there are people who do get lost doing that. For a long time and no disrespect to anyone who does uh if you're in the audience nikki you're really smiling like that's you <laughs> i mean it's mostly music yeah <laughs> music that's and that's also, yeah. which, which is robots. <laughs> <laughs> um we have a, a, just one last observation from me and i'll try and turn it into a question we haven't talked a great deal about bodies as bodies and and one of the things that's very striking in the book is the way that sometimes you just you frame you do this thing that's very striking which is just to frame the body as matter it's just corporeal yeah exist just corporeal stuff and you you sort of do that in relation i think you do it in relation to flanagan maybe um and there's this kind of really interesting question that's raised about where the self resides um and um and then in other with other examples there's the there's this kind of sense that the body is this thing that can be virtualized and and refigured and invented and that it's the word is mutable but it, it's not a fixed thing which is which is very interesting and then at times you you there's a kind of moment where you demonstrate this kind of awareness of um like a racialized body the optics of certain bodies yeah. and, and, and what certain bodies can do and can't do. And I was thinking about the way in which like the body is uh, both kind of um, a sort of matter, a th a, like matter, but also a signifier in, in the book. Um, and I wonder if you can just kind of, with reference to some specific examples, just kind of to talk us through that, if that's something that means anything. The to, idea of the body being matter. Uh, as being something that is not fixed and that can be reinvented. Yeah, um, I mean I talk about a, a trans performance artist called Nina Arsenault who has had um, a lot of surgeries in order to make herself appear uh, 
sort of extra feminine um, and her idea is that she's almost like exercising the idea of, of femininity mm. and she records her surgeries and then um, projects them and she talks about this idea of wanting to make it clear to people that her transition is something heroic that it's a um, sort of generative act that she's performing um, for for good basically mm. um, Bob Flanagan, you mentioned, who is, and we touched on him earlier, he was an artist who was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis as a child and he was given uh, not that long to live, they said he would be dead, by his early 20s and he uh, got very into s and it was this idea of uh, if he was causing the injury to his body that was seizing a kind of empowerment rather than the, the pain that he was feeling as a result of his illness. Mm-hmm. Um, and he credits s and with having helped him to live twice as long as his life expectancy. Mm. Um, so again, this is that thing of, it's the question of like, what is a good body, what is a working body, and um, what makes sense to do to that body with Bob Flanagan. Of course, it seems counterintuitive for him to be nailing his dick to things and um, like all of the other stuff that he did to himself. Again, mm. trigger warning for the whole book. Um, but it's, I suppose that's to do with where the boundaries lie on the body and the self as well. Mm. And this conception of the body as matter can be two opposing things. It can be relief and it can be empowering um, and it can also be absolutely terrifying mm. Uh, mm. to realise that that's all there is to it. It can suggest fragility um, and it can make you think about your own mortality. Um, but in the opposite way, it just completely reduces you to this essential kind of, to your essential nature, I suppose. Gristled. Yeah. Fat. (laughs) Burned. Um, Okay, well, um, can I ask one more thing? Yeah, go. Um, I mean, I think what you touch on there is, is this really central issue of agency. Yeah. I mean, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, Gina, Gina. Pain. Pain. Has agency, right? Yeah. She takes the agency. Um, she becomes a, a rally driver of a, in, in her. Oh, you mean Paige Jim? Paige Jim, yeah. sorry, sorry. And Flanagan takes agency over their own body. And, and one of the things that was very striking, particularly in the context of kind of you know an American con- a kind of neoconservative America of the eighties, which intersects with Christianity, is this idea that like your body is not your own. Yeah. That somehow your body is like um, um, belongs to some other bigger sort of state structure, you know, that like you can be criminalised for choosing to harm your own body, and that was very that was kind of that was something that was very striking that that came through particularly through someone like Flanagan. Um, um, that was an observation and not a question, but um, yeah. it was a good observation. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, very good. Um, so, hats are available. Um, hats are only available to be ordered through the internet, I'm afraid, so I don't want any disappointment. Hats. Disappointment, as if there's going to be a rush for the hats. <laughs> um, the book is available to purchase. Um, and I'd like to thank um, the Assembly House for hosting us this evening. I'd like to thank the Book Hive for bringing the books along to sell. Um, Thogden, the, the, the frontispiece. Yeah, the, yeah. The, um, for Fogden? Yes. Next one, Fogden again, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about but, it later. Yeah. <laughs> um, but most of all, I'd like to thank you for, for joining us this evening. It's been a, a total pleasure. Thank um, you, Johnny. It's a great book, and um, thank you all for coming and joining us this evening and taking part. Yeah. <laughs>